Please join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your grace today. We thank you, Father, that we could gather as your people, as uh, your called out ones, and called together as a family. And I pray, Father, that today we would uh, love each other well, and, and that you would soften our hearts as we prepare to receive your word today. God, we thank you for your word that you have spoken, and we pray that you would give us understanding today by your Holy Spirit. God, that we would leave here today with a new understanding of you and what you've done, what you've accomplished for us through your son, Jesus. And that we would leave here today with a song in our hearts, a song of praise and thanksgiving. Father, may your will be done here and may you be glorified in this church. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. It's... Uh, Good to see all of you here today. My name is Dave. I'm, I'm one of the pastors here. If you have uh, been coming just for a couple weeks, the, this, you probably have met me maybe, but uh, didn't know that I'm one of the pastors here because I haven't preached in a few weeks. And it's been really a privilege for me to be able to, uh, to just sit with you and be fed by God's word by some other brothers in our church. And I really appreciate their ministry to us, uh, Phil and Scott and Peter and um, it's been really great for the, to have them be part of this series that we've been going through called Big Questions About God. And today's actually the last Sunday uh, that we're going to be in this series, Big Questions About God. And we've been exploring some questions that oftentimes uh, skeptical people will ask about God, about the church, about religion, and things like that. And we've been, we've been talking about things like how could there be a good and loving God with, when there's so much suffering in the world? How could a loving God send people to hell? How can we know that the Bible is reliable? Uh, how can we know that God exists? And these are all, you know, really big questions that are difficult for us, even if you've been a Christian a long time. You know, how do you answer that question? It's, it's intimidating if you're talking to someone who doesn't share your faith. Well, today we're going to shift gears just a little bit. Uh, and I'd like to ask the question this morning as we close this series, are you religious? Are you religious? And the reason I'd like to ask that question is because you might be religious. And, and I can almost guarantee that uh, people in the world, maybe people you work with, your neighbors or whatever, when they hear that you're a Christian, they probably just think that you're religious. A lot of people think that, you know, Christians are just religious people, and they put, they'll put you in that category of being a religious person. Oh, you're just religious. That's cool. You know, I'm not really religious, but that's cool for you. Um, and and I, I have to tell you, you know, for, for me, religious people are just annoying. I don't know if you know any religious people. I just find religious people to be annoying. And if you're religious and, and you are proud of that... Um, I guess I'm sorry, because I probably just offended you, but religious people, are, they're always trying to do the right thing, they think they're right all the time, they judge other people's actions, they're often very critical of other people, but if you criticize them, they get all defensive. Uh, religious people are, are often so busy going to church and Bible studies and Christian events that they, they just don't have time to invest in their neighbors. Uh, when, they, when they come over to their house... You know, you, you offer them a beer, and they're like, oh, no thanks, I don't drink. Doesn't that just annoy you? Uh, <laughs> sometimes in a vulnerable moment, I, I, I might open myself up to a religious person and confess some deep struggle or, or, you know, difficulty I'm going through, and they just try to fix me. And then at the end, they'll just be like, I'll pray for you. And I'm like, thanks, you know, and that doesn't really help me, but no, I shouldn't say that, because I do believe in prayer. But, but sometimes I think they'll just say, I'm, I'll pray for you, and then they just go home and talk to someone else about the problems I just shared with them, because that's what religious people do. They're usually really opinionated about politics, and they take it personally when you disagree with them, and I think many religious people actually believe that Jesus was a Republican, and that just annoys me. Um, have I offended anyone yet? I, have I at least got your attention? Thank you for being honest with me. Now, even though the Bible, in one place that I know of, talks about religion as a good thing, most of the time, the biblical writers have not very good things to say about religion. 
it's mostly talked about in a negative way. And there's actually a big difference between religion and following Jesus. And if you didn't know that, you might mistake religion for following Jesus. They're not the same thing. It's just not the same thing. And I, and I hope that today you understand that. Now, in the ancient Greco-Roman world where, where Christianity was sort of born and, and, and exploded in the ancient Greco-Roman world in the first century when, when Jesus lived and walked the earth and things like that, the Romans began referring to Christianity as it grew as the anti-religion. And the reason they did that was because there, Christianity was this new movement and, and thousands of people were coming to faith in Jesus and this, this uh, started in Jerusalem and then it expanded into Samaria and in and the Roman Empire and all of that. But the thing that was different about the Christian movement was they didn't have a central, they didn't have a temple, they didn't have a central place of worship, they didn't offer sacrifices, they didn't have priests. In fact, they treated everyone like a priest. Um, they didn't treat any one day as special, more special than another. They didn't have these special days that were set apart as sacred days. To them, every day was the same. And so Christianity started out as this very different kind of movement. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a, like a religion. It just wasn't. It wasn't like any other religion in the world at that time. They weren't, these Christians, they weren't governed by a written code of laws. They were free. They were happy. They were diverse. They were different. Are we different? Are we any different? You know, you know what I mean? Why do people in our communities look at us and just think, oh, those are just religious people. I don't understand that. So I'd like to take a minute this morning and, and explore sort of the history of religion and how this all started. And there, um, there's a guy named Sky Jathani. He wrote a book called With. And, and in his book, he, he talks about the, orig the origins of religion. And what he does is he pictures a small ancient tribe or community Thousands of years ago, I'd like you to picture this for a minute, just this small um, agrarian tribe or community just living off the land trying to survive. And their survival depended on forces beyond their control, depended on the, the weather patterns, their crops all depended on weather, which they couldn't predict. It depended on, you know, the migration of herds, uh, depended on, their survival depended on whether or not a fever would, would break or if it would just get worse and worse, or if a virus would spread or be killed off. Their very way of life depended on those things, on all these different factors that were beyond their control. And they did not have ways to understand those things, like science, science and technology like we do. Like we can predict the weather today, we can understand how the body works and how um, the, the migration of herds and all those different things. They didn't have any of that. So eventually what they did was they developed this, they, they personified all of these natural forces that they couldn't understand. And they ascribed them to these personal forces in the universe that had wills. And that's how they, that's how they sort of came to understand the universe and the world and the forces around them. And so they, they invented basically these gods as a way to understand and interpret their reality. And those gods would personify nature and disease and fertility and all these other things, right? For example, spring did not arrive because the Earth's axis shifted, allowing more sunlight to hit the northern hemisphere. But to them, spring arrived because some god willed it to come. But the problem was these gods were very unpredictable. They, they just, they were, they were moody. They had to be appeased. And so the people developed a system which, would, which involved certain rituals and sacrifices and behaviors. And they believed if, that if you behaved in a certain way and offered a certain amount of sacrifices and did these certain rituals that you could make these gods happy. And so at the end of the year, if your field didn't produce as much as your neighbor's field did, it was probably because the gods were more happy with him than with you. That's how they interpreted their environment. And, and here's how religion works. Religion is a way for people to control what would otherwise be unpredictable forces. That's kind of how religion works. And that sounds so archaic, right? It just doesn't, like, 
we are advanced, modern, educated, sophisticated people. We don't think that way anymore, right? But actually, we kind of do. Because we have to admit today that even with all of our advances in technology and science and medicine and all, that other, all of those other things, we still have to admit that our survival depends on forces that are beyond our control. Isn't that true? And we don't like that. We don't like being victims of chance. And so every single year, we ask ourselves questions like, will my business turn a profit this year? Will my kids be healthy? Will we stay safe? Will we be healthy? Will we see a return on that investment? Will the Bucks make the finals this year? Will I still be at my company at the end of the year? Will we get pregnant? Will I ever experience a mass shooting firsthand? Some of us are asking that question now. And all of those things are uncertainties. All of those things are dependent on factors that are beyond our control. We're still victims of chance, we think. Right? That's how we think. We, we, we want to believe that our actions can affect the world around us, and this lends to a growing allegiance to all kinds of religions. Still today, even though you know, people like John Lennon and other visionaries of the 20th century were telling us, that eventually we won't need a religion anymore. We'll, grow, we'll outgrow our need for it. And yet today, in the 21st century, religions are growing faster than ever. Because people still understand that we are victims of chance and that our survival depends on things that are outside of our control. And religion becomes a way for most people to sort of con- try to control the outcome of their lives. And if I adopt and obey this religious code or this belief system or this way of living, God will be on my side. Isn't that how religion works? If I obey God and I do what's right and I avoid bad behaviors and bad people, then God won't let me be a victim of chance. He will bless me. He will take care of me. We'll be okay. Have have you ever been told in a church... That as long as you obey God and you go to church and you give financially to the church and you avoid immoral behavior that God will bless you, I certainly have. I've been told that in a church. I I, I can remember as as a young person, I I went to a Christian school for part of my, uh, you know, middle school and high school education, Uh, went to church a lot, and I was told over and over again as a young person, don't have sex. Wait until you're married. If you wait, God will bless you. The sex you will enjoy in marriage will be out of this world. Your marriage will be protected. You'll have a better life. Just wait. But what happens when people wait and they save themselves for marriage and then their marriage falls apart? What about those people? What do you tell them? They waited. You said God would bless them if they waited. And And they did wait, and now their marriage is over. And they might feel like, hey, God, I did what I was supposed to do. Why didn't you do what you were supposed to do? What happens when you obey the code, and you do the right things, and you avoid the wrong things, and God doesn't give you the life you wanted? What do you do then? How do you relate to God then? I I have a lot of experience with religion, by the way, personal experience. As I said, I I grew up in the church. I went to church multiple days a week. The the takeaway from many of the sermons that I heard growing up was this. As a Christian, there there are things you do and there are things you don't do. That's what makes someone a Christian. A Christian goes to church. A Christian prays. A Christian believes certain things about God, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, about the Bible. A Christian reads the Bible. A Christian gives money to the church and to missionaries. A Christian spanks their children. A Christian votes Republican. I could go on. Is any of this sounding familiar? And I also learned that there are certain things, there's a lot of things that Christians don't do that other people do, right? This list could be really long. A Christian doesn't swear a Christian doesn't drink, a Christian doesn't watch rated R movies or gamble or look at pornography or have sex with people you're not married to, a Christian doesn't listen to hip-hop unless it's Christian hip-hop, 
Christians don't wear a modest clothing, they don't get tattoos, and on and on and on. And that is how I came to understand Christianity. It's about what I do and what I don't do. And so in my mind, as I'm a young person, you know, forming this vision of God, I, 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 I decided that God likes it when I do the things I'm supposed to do, but he doesn't like it when I do the things I'm not supposed to do. So as a young man, I've, I, just, I just decided that God must like me on my good days and not like me very much on my bad days. And a lot of my young life was spent feeling guilty because as it turns out, I'm better at doing bad things than good things. You know what I mean? I, doing bad things just came really easy for me. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And when you think God is mad at you, what are you not going to do? You are not going to go looking for God. And so when you, when you do those bad things, it creates this separation between you and God and this sense of guilt and shame. And I can't, I can't go near God some people, they stop going to church because they feel so guilty, because they feel like, I'm not good enough. And because you aren't good enough, what are you going to do? You're going to try to clean up your act first. You, you, you think, I've got to clean up my act first, I've got to get right, and then I can go back to church, then I can go back into God's presence. But here's the thing, you can't clean up your act first. You can't do it. I, I can't do it. I, c I never could do it, even though I tried. So instead of cleaning up my act, I would promise God that I was going to try harder and be better and that I would stop doing the bad things and start doing the good things. And then I would feel better for a little while because I would pray this very sincere prayer and, and, and kind of make it right with God and promise God I wasn't going to do that anymore until eventually I broke my promise to God. And then I would feel guilty And, and around and around it would go, this just this cycle of making promises and then breaking the promise and then feeling guilty and offering an empty promise back to God. It, it was basically a life of fear and self-loathing. That's what it was, just fear and self-loathing over and over and over again. And if you're a religious person, you're probably stuck somewhere in between self-loathing and self-righteousness. You know, you either feel, you're either beating yourself up because you messed up again, or you're patting yourself on the back because you're doing really well. And those are both really bad places to be. Really bad places to be. So if religion isn't the answer, what is? What is the answer? Now Jesus gave people a new way to understand and approach God. That's what Jesus did. When Jesus came into the world, one major part of his mission was showing people what God is really like because there were a lot of wrong ideas out there about God. And one of them was God loves good people and he doesn't like bad, bad people. And if you have a good life, it's because God loves you. And if you have a bad life, a hard life, it's because God doesn't love you. And Jesus completely shattered that view of God everywhere that he went. And he started offering a new way to think about God that was not religious at all. In fact, Jesus did not expect people to master certain behaviors or memorize tons of scripture and keep all the rules or else live under the constant threat of God's judgment. He didn't talk about God that way. He didn't teach that only people who achieved a certain level of enlightenment or understanding or moral pedigree would gain access to God. Instead, Jesus went to all kinds of people who had very low social and moral status and very low levels of education and very low standards of living. The kind of people that religious people looked at and thought about them as unclean. Like those people are unclean and clearly not acceptable to God. Those are the people Jesus spent most of his time with. And he loved them, and he touched them, and he showed them what God is really like. And religious people never understood that. And they would complain to Jesus and ask Jesus, like, why are you spending time with these people? Why are you eating and drinking with these people? Why are you associating with these people? You say you're a messenger of God, and yet you're spending all this time with people who are clearly far from God. They didn't understand. Because to a religious person, the world is very black and white. 
You're either good or you're bad. You're in or you're out. And they don't like gray areas, and they're not comfortable with mysteries. And Jesus was a mystery to them because he said he came from God, and he was a righteous man, and he taught with authority, and yet he spent most of his time with very irreligious people. He did not speak or behave like a religious leader. He didn't seem to care at all about what people thought about him. He did not do anything for the sake of human praise or to get a bigger following. Instead, he chose a bunch of nobodies to be his closest friends and to finish what he started. And the main point of all of his teaching was the gospel. The gospel. That is the answer. The gospel, the good news, that's what Jesus came to talk about. That was his main message everywhere he went. He preached the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of God's kingdom. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Mark introduces us to Jesus' teaching by saying this. This is what Jesus said. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. That's what Jesus' message was in a nutshell. Notice he didn't say, repent of your sins and try harder. He said, repent of your sins and believe the good news. Now, what is the good news? The the Greek word for the good news or the gospel is this word called euangelion. And it's used all over the New Testament. And it's a word that means literally good news. That's what the word means. But it was most commonly used in a military context where in ancient times what you had was you had, let's say you had two cities or two nations that were going to war and they would, maybe they would meet at a neutral location in a valley somewhere or an open field and they would go to war and those two armies would leave and they would meet each other on this battlefield and they would, they would have this war. And what would happen was one army would defeat the other. And once they defeated that army, they would go and lay siege to the city. And they might destroy the city. They might burn it to the ground. They might destroy all the women and children. Or they might take them as their slaves or take them into exile to a different, to their own city. Or something like that. And so if you're a citizen, the average Joe in your city or your country, and you know your nation's at war... You're kind of in limbo and you're a little anxious because you don't know what the outcome of that war is going to be. If it's a bad outcome, your life is going to change forever, right? It's a, it's a haunting prospect. And how would you find, and, and of course, if it's a good outcome, then life goes on. Maybe it gets even a little better for you. But the way you find out what the outcome is, is a messenger is sent ahead of the army, There's a messenger that's watching and waiting to see what the outcome of this battle is going to be. And whenever they find out, you know, what's going to happen, they quickly make go back to the town, back to the city, back to where the people are, and they get everyone's attention. And believe me, everyone's paying attention. And they tell everyone the news from the battlefront. So if you're a messenger, you're coming back, you you get back and you go to a high place and you get everyone's attention. You say, I have news. And everyone gathers around to find out what's going to happen next. And if it was good news, they would say, I have good news. We won the battle. And that was the the euangelion. That's the good news. You won. Life will go on for you. We won the battle, right? And that's, that's how the New Testament authors, that's how Jesus described his message that he was bringing to everyone. It was like, there, it's like there are these people all over the world living in darkness, living without hope, living with sin in their life, not really sure, you know, what God thinks of them, what God will say to them, what God will do to them next, how God feels about them, or what God will do when their time finally runs out and they have to stand face to face with with God their creator and give an account for their life and Jesus is coming and he's saying I have good news I have good news God is not who you thought he was he's better 
He's won. He has defeated your sin. See, someone pulled up this morning into the parking lot, and their license plate says, God won. And I'm like, that is a great license plate. You know, that describes the gospel message. God won. God overcame sin. Jesus did. Or on the cross and through his resurrection, he overcame all the armies of evil. You don't have to fear the punishment for your sin anymore. Jesus has been victorious. That's what the gospel is. It's an announcement. It's this announcement of good news that Jesus Christ has won. He has been victorious over sin and death. The gospel is this announcement of something that has happened in history, that Jesus Christ died for your sins to forgive your sins. He was buried and he rose again to give you life everlasting with God your Father. And nothing, nothing from here to eternity ever will separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing ever again will separate you from, love, from God's love. No matter what happens to you in this life, whether you have a hard life or you have a good, easy life, God's love for you will never change. And you can have hope in this world no matter what you're going through. That's the gospel. It's not about some code. It's not about some rituals. It's not about what you do or don't do. It's about what God has done in history to make you right with him, to bring you home to him. That's what the gospel is all about. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again, just like God always promised. One of my favorite gospel passages is Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. The Apostle Paul just unpacks this amazing news, and, and this is how he describes it. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight, and, and this word is translated justified, since we've been made right in God's sight or justified by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation or wrath. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, in other words, before you ever cleaned your, your act up, before you could ever do anything to make yourself right with God, Jesus died for us while we were still his enemies, and we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. So the gospel says God does not change his mind about you based on what you do or don't do. God loves you and accepts you based on, not based on your performance, but based on Jesus' performance. Do you see the difference? God judges you based on what Jesus has already done. So here's one way we could describe the gospel today. The gospel is the good news that God makes sinners righteous. That's what it is. God made his enemies friends. He makes sinners righteous. God did that. In other words, through faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus, you are pardoned. You are declared not guilty. That's what justified means. You're declared not guilty. That verdict has already come. You don't have to wait till the end of your life to hear it. God already considers you not guilty. And this means you aren't going to be judged for your good days and your bad days. That's what it means. Uh, Jerry Bridges said, said this once, Your worst days are never so bad that you are beyond the reach of, the, beyond the reach of God's grace. And your best days are never so good that you are beyond the need of God's grace. Think about that for a minute. I, I met a lady a couple weeks ago who was a guest here. And she, I actually just saw her here this morning. She's back. We always love it when someone comes back the next week, you know. Um, and she told me last week, I think it was last week, that she had not been in a church for over 20 years. She lives in the neighborhood here somewhere. She said, I've, I've not been in a church for over 20 years, but I was driving, I saw your church here, and I just felt like this might be good, this might be good for me. And I, the impression I got was that she sensed that there, there's something in her life that needs to change. And let's be honest, a lot of us are here today 
because there's something in our life that we know needs to change. And that's why a lot of people come to church for the first time in a long time, right? And that's why a lot of you keep coming back to church and have become a very, you know, involved part of our faith community here is because you believe that this is, a, this would be a, that there's something about, you know, experiencing this Christ-centered community that could produce good change in your life, in the life of your family, in the life of your kids, in your marriage, whatever it is. And and I want to tell you, that's a good thing. That's a good reason to come here. But I also want to tell you that religion will never change your life. Never. Religion has no power to change your life. Only faith in the gospel can change you. Only faith in Jesus can change you and make you a different kind of person. And those are two different things. In in Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 20, the Apostle Paul again wrote, You have died with Christ, and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of this world, such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. Now, I can tell you from experience, I, I, I know that this is true because I have tried it. I have tried so hard to follow the rules. I've tried to control my body. I've tried to deny myself pleasures that I knew were off limits. And no amount of teaching, no amount of rules or self-discovery, and no amount of effort was ever able to change my evil desires. The only thing that has ever changed my evil desires is faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the belief that he loves me even on my worst days. Listen to uh, the Apostle Paul once more talk about his religious experience. He says in Philippians chapter 3, we rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Though I could, I could have confidence in my own effort. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever, ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. Friends, this is how I want to sum this all up for you today. Religion is about what you must do to get right with God. That's what religion is all about. The gospel is about what God has done to make you right. And to bring you back to him. What you need, my friends, is the gospel. You don't need more religion in your life. You need the gospel. You need Jesus. And, and, and you might be thinking, you know, this is great. This is, uh, I, I, I get the difference. But how does this matter in my day-to-day life? Well, let me tell you. This makes a huge difference in the way you live from day to day. For example, when I sin, when I mess up, when I sin and I know I sinned, when I say something to my, to my child or, or when I yell at one of my five kids, I actually do that sometimes. I have to confess that. I, there's two different ways I can, there's two different things I can do, Right? Religion pressures me to run from God and hide my sin and my bad side when I sin. The gospel frees me to show myself sin and all so that I can be forgiven and loved. 
Those are two very different ways of dealing with sin. When you sin, whether it's in public or in private, those are two very different ways of dealing with sin. Religion always causes you to hide. It always causes you to wear a mask and put your best foot forward. The gospel allows you to be yourself and to allow other people to see you, even the bad parts. And it allows you to be loved and forgiven. When I sin, religious, religion produces guilt in me that can only be taken away by me making up for that sin and paying God back in some way and negotiating with God. That's what religion does. It teaches me how to negotiate with God. But the gospel does not produce guilt. Instead, it produces a kind of sorrow over what I've done. But as soon as I acknowledge my sin and confess it, I'm totally free from it. There's no more keeping accounts. There's no more going back to it and... and negotiating. Instead, that fleeting sorrow is quickly overcome by the joy and peace I have in knowing Christ died for my sin and has already wiped it away. And I'm a new creation. I'm accepted. I'm loved by God. When I'm tempted, religion says I should not sin because if I do, I'll be punished. The gospel says I'm already accepted through faith, which makes me start to hate the sin in my life. And the more I believe the gospel, the more I don't want to sin. The gospel produces obedience by love, not fear. When somebody wrongs me or angers me or hurts me, religion says that the offender must pay for what they did before I can forgive them. The gospel makes me want to forgive them because of what Christ did for me. The gospel gives me a tender heart towards the people who hurt me. And because it reminds me that I'm forgiven and I can forgive others. I don't ever have to hold on to the pain others have caused me. I'm not defined by what other people do to me. I'm defined by what Christ has done for me. When I have success in my life, when I win, religion says that that's because of hard work, talent, discipline, and determination, and God must be really happy with me. But the gospel says that when I succeed, it's all because of grace. And it just makes me humble and thankful. When I fail, religion says that my failure is punishment for doing bad things. So I'm afraid of failure. The gospel says failure is not final. You're not defined by your failure. Failure is never final if you have faith in the gospel. When my kids fail, religion causes me to be embarrassed and ashamed and to immediately correct their behavior because it's all about behavior with your kids, right? It causes me to focus on my kids' behavior. But the gospel allows me to see past their behavior and to see what's going on in my kids' heart and to help them turn to Christ and ask for forgiveness. The religion says, I obey in order to be accepted. But the gospel says, I'm accepted, so I want to obey. And, and lastly, when you hear that Jesus died for your sins, a religious person says, that's cool, and they walk away. Because <laughs> they've heard that so many times, it doesn't mean anything anymore. But if you know Jesus... When you hear the gospel, you rejoice. You rejoice every time. You rejoice over and over again because you feel free and you feel light. And you know that following Jesus is not a burden. It's the best way to live. And you feel like you want to worship God and praise God and tell other people about this news, about this gospel. Listen, we, we all want to know that God accepts us as we are, not as we should be but as we really are, and we want to know that God looks at us and he sees all of our flaws and all of our failures and all of our deficiencies, and he says, I love you. I even like you. I just want to be with you no matter what condition you in, you're in, no matter what kind of day you've had, no matter what you're going through. I'm all in, and there's nothing that could change that. Nothing you do could ever change that. Is that kind of approval possible with God? 
Can we experience that kind of righteousness? Can we be so right with God that his posture towards us is like that of a father with his newborn baby boy or girl or like a husband gazing into the eyes of his new bride? When you think about God and, and how does God look at you? When you think about your life and how, how does God feel about you? Do, you, do you picture God that way, looking at you like, like you are his own child? Because that's how Jesus says God thinks about you. Listen, my friends, when we come into God's presence, may we never try to make ourselves better than we are. May we not pretend that we are good people. May we simply say that by grace we have been accepted. By grace we have access to God. May we be the first people to admit what we don't know. May we say that we are no better than the prisoner, no better than the prostitute, no better than the adulterer or the pedophile or the murderer. We are no more worthy of God's mercy than any of those people. All we have is Jesus. It's all grace. It's all grace. So today, I'm only going to ask you to repent of your religious ways today. Repent of your self-righteousness. Repent of your good deeds that you do for the praise of people. Admit your need for Christ and thank God today that he has brought you back to life. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gospel of Jesus, which tells us that we were all sinners, we were all enemies until Jesus died for our sins on the cross. And God, you sent Jesus to die for our sins while we were your enemies. And you have called us, God, in your grace and in your mercy, you have called us out of darkness and into your wonderful light so that we could become your children. And you did that because you love us, God. Not because we've earned your favor. Not because we have earned your acceptance. Not because we are worthy of your presence. But simply because you love us, God. So today we thank you for your love. We thank you for the gospel that makes us new. And we pray, Father, that you would make us a people who are not known for what we do or don't do, but who are known for our love. God, let us be known for our love for you and our love for one another, God. Let that be the thing that people in our community talk about when they talk about Cross Point Church, that those people love each other. May our love stand out more than anything else. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Before I uh, let you go in just a minute, uh, I just wanted to talk about this Invite Your One series really quick because we've been talking about it for a couple weeks now. And there are already people in our church who have invited people to our fall kickoff on September uh, 15th. And so what I'm going to ask you to do, and this will become more clear as we go through the series and stuff like that, but you've, you have these cards that are in your handout today, and it asks you to write the name of someone that you are going to commit to inviting to our fall kickoff. And we're going to be praying for that person uh, when you turn that in, that's going to go to Pastor Scott, and then there's going to be a group of us that are going to meet in the loft every Sunday for 30 minutes to pray for those specific people over the next few weeks as they think about, am I going to really go to this thing, or am I just going to, you know, do my own Sunday morning ritual or whatever that is. And uh, we're going to be praying for their hearts, we're going to be praying that, that people receive the gospel that day, that people, ultimately what we want is we want people to become part of our community here. That's what we want. We want them, not just that we're not looking for, for like to fill the auditorium. We want people to become part of this movement, part of this gospel movement at Cross Point. And we also want you, we also want you to become the kind of person that is regularly inviting your friends to, to your home, to church, to think about Jesus and stuff like that. So that's what that's about. So we just want you to fill out that name in the card, turn it in, and then once you've invited that person, once you've invited your one, whether they say yes or no, we want you to just write their first name on the canvas that's hanging out in the lobby there. And uh, just write their name. So we just want to know that you've invited them. That's all. Even if they say no and, and you might get rejected. Listen, I've been rejected so many times. I invite people to church quite frequently, and I get told no all the time, but every once in a while someone says yes, and it's great. It's probably about one in, one in three, 
one in three, maybe one in four, people say yes. And um, so if, you, if someone says no, you can always invite someone else. I know it's, the series is invite your one, but you don't have to just invite one person. So we'll be talking a little more about that in weeks to come, but I just wanted to, to make that clear about uh, what those cards are all about. So um, I want to thank you for being here today. If you're a guest, I'd love the opportunity to meet you. Uh, but at this time, I'm just going to have everyone rise, and I'll give you the benediction, and you'll be, you'll be free to go and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. The benediction this morning comes from this amazing passage in Matthew chapter 11, and I'd like you to listen to these words of Jesus as he spoke to a small crowd. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, please bow your heads with me. Then Jesus said, Come to me. All of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Amen.